Good morning, everyone. So our lesson for today is about lesson number four, meeting plants need. Like humans and animals, plants have very specific nutritional and environmental needs that must be met in order for the plant to grow and develop. Both humans and plants must consume a balanced diet and need protection from harsh environment. Plants all over the world have adapted to specific environments. A tomato plant, for instance, is a tropical plant and thrives in average daytime temperature of 80 Fahrenheit and nighttime temperature of 60 Fahrenheit. When grown in temperatures outside these parameters, a tomato plant may survive but not thrive and if the temperature are too extreme, the tomato plant will die. Individual species of plants have very specific nutritional needs that must be met. These needs may vary throughout the stages of plant's growth. For instance, a tomato plant needs more nitrogen during the vegetative growth stages and less nitrogen during the fruiting stages. As a compromise to various needs and stages of growth, hydrophonic solution can generally be modified to be suitable for the majority of plants. For best results, it is a good idea to plant crops with similar needs together so the compromise in minimal. In the soil, organic matters are broken down to release minerals and nutrients. They can then be dissolved in water, taken up by the roots and passed through the stem into the leaves. In hydroponics, we provide the minerals a plant needs in a water-soluble form, ready to be taken up by the plant's root. We are therefore able to provide a very exact diet for our plants in the most usable form. The more precisely a plant's needs are met, the more vigorous its growth will be. When you observe a lush, healthy plant, you can be sure that most or all of its environment and nutritional requirements are being met. When growing plants in a hydroponic garden, we must consider these factors. Number one is the amount of water the plants need, proper drainage of growing medium. As if all plants need, the amount of water required depends on the species and the needs of that particular plant. A plant that suffers from lack of water will extend a huge but not very effective root system and will develop a very small plant above the ground. Many roots are sent out in search of water and when an adequate amount is found, the plant will not grow to its potential. In the other extreme, if a plant is overwatered, the roots can drown because they are not receiving the proper amount of fresh oxygen. This makes proper drainage of a hydroponic growing medium crucial to your plant's health. The last consideration concerning the water you feed your plants is purity. In a hydroponic garden, you should use as pure of water as possible. Water that has possible toxic contaminants or salt build-ups may stunt or kill your plants. Next is the optimum temperature and light for the plant. The ideal temperature depends on the crops you choose to grow. Most of the common garden crops such as tomato, cucumber, lettuce, beans, and peas will do well with an average daytime temperature of 78 Fahrenheit and an average nighttime temperature of 64 Fahrenheit.
Winter vegetables such as cabbage, brussels, sprout, and broccoli should be grown in slightly cooler temperature. A minimum or maximum ter thermometer will allow you to track the low and high temperatures in your growing environment. This is important for monitoring overall progress of your hydroponic garden and diagnosing plant growth problems. For optimum production, heating the root zone is important. For most garden crops, 72 Fahrenheit is the ideal root zone temperature. Some growers achieve a heated root area by using heated grow uh, mats placed under the growing medium. And another option is to heat your nutrient solution to the desired uh, temperature. And then when your system feeds the plants, the roots are bathed in wat warm water. Next is fresh air. Plants require adequate air circulation around the plants, as well as proper aeration in the root zone. Poor ventilation in the growing environment encourages mold, mildew, and plant disease. Many hydroponic gardens are located off the floor for better air circulation. Commercial hydroponic greenhouse growers use large fans and air circulation equipment to provide adequate air environment. Next is shelter and support. In a commercial application, many hydroponic farmers grow their crops inside of a controlled environment greenhouse. This not only provides shelter, but also an ideal stress-free environment for the plant because many hydroponic gardens are quite small and very clean. They can be set up almost anywhere indoors on a patio or a window sill, making it easy for the gardener to provide shelter for the plants. In a traditional garden, the soil anchors the plant and provides support. In hydroponics, the growing medium helps support the plant to some extent, but most often, additional support is needed. Plant stakes, thing, um, string rather, and clips are often used for this. The next is pest and disease control. Since there is no soil in hydroponics, many, um, but not all plant diseases are eliminated. Well-kept and clean growing environments are the best prevention when it comes to plant disease. Always remove dead or dying matter and any unhealthy plants from your hydroponic garden. If you are growing indoors, the chances of pest infestations are greatly reduced. In the event of pest problems, there are many biological control that you can apply or available. Number six is the water-soluble minerals the plant needs. As mentioned earlier, a hydroponic gardener uses minerals that are water-soluble and ready to be taken up by the plant roots. Scientists and researchers actually have determined exactly what minerals a plant needs and in what quantities. So a large number of hydroponic nutrient formulas have been developed and although some have better results than others, there is no one perfect mix mixture. Um, the success of each nutrient formula depends on the condition it is used in and what plants are being grown. Many hydroponic gardeners use a pre-mixed nutrients uh, formula that they simply add water to. These formulas contain all the minerals and nutrients that a plant needs in the correct proportions and are available in powder or in a liquid form. So we have, if you remember during your grade seven, I told you that the nutrients needed by the plant is divided into two, 
macro and micronutrients. So the macronutrients a plant needs include nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, potassium, sulfur, magnesium, iron. While the trace elements or the micronutrients needed by the plants, which is used in minute quantities, a plant needs include manganese, boron, zinc, copper, molybdenum. Next or the last factor is the proper pH of the nutrient solution. So when you say pH, it is the measurement of the hydrogen ion or ion concentration in a particular medium such as water, soil, or nutrient solution. So it can be um, identified as the alkalinity and the acidity of the water. So pH is the measurement of the hydrogen ion, as I've said. So the pH of a medium or nutrient solution is important to plant growth. Each plant has a preferred pH range. pH ranges beyond the preferred for a given plant may cause stunted growth or even death. So very low pH or high pH can severely damage plant roots and have detrimental effects on plant growth. As the pH level changes, it directly affects the availability of nutrients. The majority of nutrients are available to a plant at a pH range of 6 to 7.5. Somewhere within that range is the ideal pH level for the most plants. When pH levels are extremely high or extremely low, the nutrients become lack in solution and unavailable to the plant. At extremely low pH level, some micronutrients such as the manganese may be released at toxic levels. The newer and more popular growing mediums like perlite, rock wool, and expanded clay pebbles have a neutral pH and will not alter your nutrient solution. Peat moss, sawdust, vermiculite, and some of the other materials that have been used for hydrophonic growing in the past are often unstable and will alter the pH of your nutrient solution. So the pH of your nutrient solution should be checked when you first mix it and then check every few days when it is in your hydrophonic reservoir. Next we have the three common methods of testing your pH. We have the litmus paper. So the main use of the litmus paper um, is to test whether a soil is acidic or basic. So the blue litmus paper turns red under acidic conditions and red litmus paper turns blue under basic or alkaline conditions. With the color change occurring over the pH range, 4.5 to 8.3 at 25 uh, degrees Celsius or 77 degree Fahrenheit. Neutral litmus paper is uh, the color of the neutral is purple. So litmus paper simply um, simply dip the end of the paper into the solution to be tested and then compare the color of the litmus paper which will have changed when dipped into the solution. So the color the pH chart to determine the pH. Next is pH test kit. So when you say pH test kit, it is a chemical test kit that uses a colorimetric method to measure pH. Monitors pH to maintain healthy freshwater condition in your tank. So pH control is imperative to prevent the harmful effects of overly alkaline or acidic aquarium water on fish and plant life. So take a few minutes each week to maintain and monitor your pH conditions with this easy to use kits. Test read pH from 6 to 7.6 and will help you quickly and easily determine whether your levels are too high or too low. So pH test kit 
you take a sample of your solution in a vial and add several drops of the pH indicator, the sample will change into different colors and can then be compared to the uh, pH chart. Next is by using pH pen or a meter or pH meter. So a pH pen or meter is a scientific instrument that measures the hydrogen ion activity in water-based solutions, indicating its acidity or alkalinity expressed as pH. So the pH meter measures the difference in electrical potential between a pH electrode and a reference electrode. And so the pH meter is sometimes referred to as a potentiometric pH met meter. So the difference in electrical potential relates to the acidity of pH of the solution and the pH meter is used in many applications ranging from laboratory experimentation to quality control. So again, when you use pH pen or met meter, simply dip the end of the pen or the probe on a pH meter into the solution and it gives you a digital reading of the pH. Now is how to alter your pH. So altering your pH, if you find that your pH is too alkaline or too high, you can increase acidity or lower pH by adding um, white vinegar or sulfuric acid or, P, um, or pH down. If you find that your pH is too acidic too low, you can increase alkalinity, raise pH by adding baking soda or pH up. When adjusting your pH, it is important to add small amount um, measuring as you go until you know exactly how much to add per gallon of water to reach the desired level. So following are the target pH ranges for various garden crops, such as the beans, ranges to 5.8 to 6.2, cabbage, 6.3 to 6.5, cucumber, 5.7 to 6.2, eggplant, 5.7 to 5.9, lettuce, 5.7 to 6.2, melons, 5.4 to 5.6, peas, 6.3 to 6.5, Peppers, 5.8 to 6.2. Radishes, 5.8 to 6.2. Strawberries, 5.8 to 6.2. And last, tomatoes, 5.8 to 6. So if you plan to grow a variety of crops, some compromise will be necessary. Again, growing plants with like needs together will yield the best result. So let's talk about nutrient requirements and testing. So many hydrophonic formula have been developed over the past 40 years with some designed uh, for specific plants while others are designed for general hydrophonic gardening. For plant growth, the concentration of individual elements must stay within certain ranges that have been determined through scientific explanation. So the average concentration of this element should fall within these parameters. Take note that PPM is uh, what the meaning is parts per million. So the nitrogen nitrate form, it has 70 to 300 PPM. Nitrogen or ammonium form, it has 0 to 31 PPM. Potassium, 200 to 400 PPM. Phosphorus 30 to 90 ppm, calcium 150 to 400 ppm, sulfur 60 to 330 ppm, magnesium 25 to 75 ppm, iron 0.5 to 5.0 ppm, boron 0 0.1 to 1.0 ppm, manganese 0 0.1 to 1.0 ppm, zinc 0.02 to 0 0.2 ppm, molybdenum 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 ppm, and copper, we have 0 0.02 to 0 0.2 ppm. So different plant uses um, of individual elements. So um, like for example, nitrogen. 
So, by the way, um, plant uses of individual elements, uh, carefully experimentation or experiment using hydrophonics have shown that each of the elements a plant need has a very specific function in a plant growth. So let's talk about nitrogen. So nitrogen is a component of proteins which form an essential part of protoplasm and also occur as stored foods in plant cells. Nitrogen is also a part of other organic compounds in plants such as chlorophyll, amino acids, alkaloids, and some plant hormones. Next is phosphorus. So this element is also a component of some plant proteins, phospholipids, sugar phosphates, nucleic acids, uh, ATP and NADP, the highest percentage of phosphorus occurs in the parts of the plant that are growing rapidly. Next is what we call the potassium. So potassium accumulates in tissues that are growing rapidly. It will migrate from older tissue to meristematic regions. For example, during the maturing of the crop, there is a movement of potassium from leaves into the fruit. Next element is sulfur. So the sulfur forms a part of the protein molecule. So plant proteins may have from 0.5 to 1.5 percent of this element. So the sulfhydryl group is a very important group essential for the action of certain enzymes and coenzymes. In addition, sulfur is a constituent of feridoxine and of some lipids. Next is calcium. So all, all ordinary green plants require calcium. It is one of the constituents of the middle lamella of the cell wall where it occurs in the form of calcium pectate. So calcium affects the permeability of cytoplasmic membranes and the hydration of colloids. Calcium may be found in combination with organic acids in the plant. The next one is magnesium. So when you see magnesium is a constituent of chlorophyll, it occupies a central position in the molecule. So chlorophylls are the only major compounds of plants that contain magnesium as a stable component. So many enzyme reactions, particularly those involving a transfer of phosphate, are activated by magnesium ions. Iron also is, um, is one of the elements need by the plant. So a number of essential compounds in plants contain iron in a form that is bound firmly into the molecule. So iron plays a role in being the site on some electron carriers where electrons are absorbed and then given off during electron transport. So the iron atom is alternately reduced and then oxidized. And then iron plays a very important role in energy conversion, reactions of both uh, photosynthesis and transpiration. Next is boron. So boron, although the exact function of a boron in a plant metabolism is unclear, boron does play a regular role in carbohydrate breakdown. So symptoms of boron deficiency include stunted roots and shoot elongation. So lack of the flowering, darkening of tissues, and growth abnormal abnormalities. Next is zinc. So zinc is essential to the normal development of a variety of plants. Large quantities of zinc are toxic to plants. Manganese uh, is the importance of manganese as an activator of several enzymes of aerobic transpiration. Explain some of the disruptive effects of a manganese deficiency on metabolism. So the most obvious sign of a manganese deficiency is chlorosis. So manganese chlorosis results in the leaf taking on a mottled uh, appearance. Next is copper. So copper is a constituent of certain enzymes, uh, enzyme systems such as ascorbic acid, 
oxidize and cytochrome oxidize. So in addition, copper is found in plastocyanin, uh, part of the electron transport chain in photosynthesis. And the last one is molybdenum. So molybdenum is important in enzyme systems involved in nitrogen fixes, fixation. And the nitrate reduction plants suffering molybdenum deficiency can absorb nitrate ions but are unable to use uh, this form of nitrogen. So hydrophonic nutrient mixes. So a gardener can purchase all of these minerals separately and mix their own hydrophonic fertilizer. So unfortunately, the fertilizers that make up a hydrophonic formula are sold as pure nitrogen or pure potassium. So it gets more complex. So they are sold as chemical compounds such as calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate, magnesium sulfate, potassium sulfate, and monopotassium um, phosphate. So since there are many dependable premix hydrophonic formula available, it is generally more efficient and more economical to use a proven formula that contains all of the above mentioned nutrients in the correct quantities for plant growth. So one that you simply add water. So whether you are using a premix formula or creating your own, it is important to follow these guidelines. So number one, weigh or measure the nutrients carefully. Second, place the nutrients in separate piles or containers to be sure that the proportions make sense. Third, be sure to comp no components are left out or measured twice. Fourth, accuracy should be within 5%. Fifth, when you are sure the proportion are correct, pour your nutrients into the water in the mixing containers and stir vigorously. Nutrients will dissolve best in warm water. And last, measure the nutrient concentration level and record it. So, um, let's talk about nutrient disorder. So, I have here a table um, show that different nutrient disorders of a plant. So when you say nutrient disorders, it is a um, deficiency of different nutrients such as nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, sulfur, iron, magnesium, zinc, molybdenum, and copper. So as the picture, um, it reflects the different deficiency that the plant experience if there is um, lack of nutrients and also if there is an excess of nutrients involved uh, or given to the So deficiencies and excesses of the nutrients. So when you say nutrient deficiencies in plant, um, let's talk about nitrogen. So the deficiency in nitrogen, the older leaves turns chlorotic and may even eventually die. So plant is standard foliage is like green. And if you have an excess nitrogen, the plant becomes over vigorous, leaves become very dark green, fruit clusters have excessive growth, and fruit ripening is delayed. So deficiency of a potassium, older leaves appear chlorotic between veins, but veins remain green, leaf edges may burn or roll. And uh, the excess of potassium is uncommon to show toxicity. Secondary, um, manganese deficiency may occur. Then for the phosphorus deficiency, the stem, the leaf, veins, petioles turns yellow, followed by reddish purplish as phosphorus is drawn from them into the new growth. 
uh, seedlings may develop slowly, fruiting is poor, and the excess of phosphorus, no direct toxicity. So copper and zinc available, availability may be reduced. Calcium uh, deficiency, the plant is stunted. Young leaves turn uh, yellow, blossoms die and fall off. Um, tomato may develop brown spots on the fruit. And the excess of calcium, no direct toxicity. Uh, sulfur uh, deficiency, younger leaves become yellow with purpling at base, older leaves turns light green. So the excess of sulfur, small leaves. Okay, for let's talk about the iron deficiency. So the new growth pales or veins stay green, blossoms drop off, yellowing occurs between veins. So the excess of iron is very uncommon. Magnesium deficiency, older leaves curl and yellow areas appear between veins. So young leaves curl and become brittle. And then the excess of magnesium, no direct toxicity. So zinc deficiency, leaves become chlorotic between veins and often develop necrotic uh, spots while the excess of in the zinc uh, reduces availability of iron. So molybdenum deficiencies, uh, older leaves turn yellow and leaf margins curl and the excess of molybdenum rare uh, tomato leaves may turn bright yellow. And last the deficiency of copper pale yellow leaves become spotted and plant is stunted and the excess of copper may reduce availability of iron. So um, let's talk about measuring conductivity. So there is a terminology that you need to understand uh, when we talk about measuring conductivity. So uh, EC means electrical conductivity, TDS, total dissolved solids, UMHO per centimeter is what we call the microns per centimeter, CF is conductivity factor, the US uh, slash CM is what we call micro Siemens per centimeter. So measuring conductivity, so when you say conductivity, it is a measure of the rate at which a small electric current flows uh, through a solution. So when the concentration of nutrients is greater, the current will flow faster. When the concentration of the nutrients is lower, the current will flow slower. So you can measure your nutrient solution to the determine how weak, strong or weak it is with an EC or electrical conductivity or TDS which is total dissolved solids meter. An EC meter usually shows the reading in either microns per centimeter or micro siemens per centimeter. So one um, microns per centimeter is equivalent to one micro siemens per centimeter centimeter. So a TDS meter usually shows the reading in milligrams per liter or parts per million or ppm. So EC is generally measured at 77 Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius if the temperature of the solution is raised. So the EC will read higher even though uh, no nutrients have been added if the temperature drops below 77 Fahrenheit or 25 centimeters. Celsius, the EC of 77 Fahrenheit, 25 Celsius will decrease. So therefore, it is important to always measure your EC at a cons consistent temperature of 77 Fahrenheit uh, or 25 Celsius. So some EC and TDS meters compensate for varying temperatures and another measurement in conductivity is CF or conductivity factor, which is expressed on a scale of I or 1 to 100. Uh, the pure water containing no nutrients is rated at zero and maximum strength nutrients will rate 100. So there, the, we have here the some general guidelines for AC levels are as follows. So um, uh, about the guidelines in fruiting plants and the leafy plants. So for initial growth or seedling stage, uh, for fruiting plants, 1,600 to 1,800 
um, uh, microns per centimeter and 1,120 to 1,000 260 ppm. So for leafy plants such as lettuce or basil, 1,400 to 1,600 um, microns per centimeter and 980 to 1,120 ppm. So the average EC, 2,500 uh, microns per centimeter, then 1,750 ppm. For leafy per lands, um, 1,800 um, microns per centimeter and 1,260 ppm. For fruiting or fruiting plants, 2,400 to 2,600 microns per centimeter and 1,680 to 1,820 ppm. And uh, for leafy plants, none. Low light conditions or winter, uh, during winter, so the fruiting plants, it needs to have 2,800 to 3,000 microns per centimeter or 2,000 ppm. And for the leafy plants, 2,000 microns per centimeter or and uh, 1,320 ppm. For the highlight conditions or during summer, for fruiting plants, it needs 2,200 to 2,400 microns per centimeter and 1,700 ppm. And for leafy plants, it needs 1,600 microns per centimeter and 1,120 ppm. So if there is a salt um, build ups when a plant uses a nutrient from a chemical salt molecule supplied in a nutrient solution it is actually using only one part of that molecule so the remaining part of that molecule generally stays in the hydrophonic system and eventually can reach damaging levels of concentration so this process which often happens in traditional agriculture where heavy fertilizer concentration are applied to soil crops is referred to as salt built up. So by testing our nutrient solution daily, we can monitor the salt levels. If the salt levels are rising, the concentration will be higher and therefore our EC reading will be higher. In our hydrophonic system, it is quite easy to resolve the problem associated with salt building up by flushing the growing medium or replace our nutrient solution with a fresh mix. So in the soil, once salt concentration reaches toxic levels, it is difficult to correct and often mix what was once excellent farm soil and usable. So the problem is exacerbated by the salts being washed and flushed into our waterways, rivers, and streams where they are also toxic to fish, birds, and other wildlife. So let's talk about hydrophonic garden nutrient monitoring. So to um, why do we need to know this? Because um, to ensure that your plants are being fed the proper nutrients and nutrient concentration, it is important to monitor your nutrient solution. So on a daily basis, you should test the nutrient solution and record the results. So EC, the nutrient concentrations, pH, the acidity and alkalinity of uh, uh, the pH or the water solution, temperature of nutrient solution, the daytime room temperature, and nighttime room temperature. So it is also important to record when you replace your nutrient solution. So you can easily determine when it should again be replaced. So in addition to this test, you may also want to record the stage of uh, plant growth, the size of your plants, and any problems or significant changes. So again, the stage of plant growth, the size of your plants, and any problems or significant changes. So uh, all you have to do is record when you replace your nutrient solution. So you can easily determine when it should again be replaced. Advanced nutrient testing. So when you say advanced nutrient testing, neither an EC or TDS meter can indicate precisely what nutrients makes up 
the fertilizer solution. More complete test kits are available for this purpose. Many commercial growers test their nutrient solution on a regular basis to ensure they are feeding exactly the mix that is intended. Regular leaf analysis is an excellent tool for determining the health of your plants. Leaf tissue samples are dried, crushed, and analyzed to determine the exact nutrient content. So most of the more complex kits will test nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus and sulfur, and the commercial labs offer more precise results. So in the event of the combination of the nutrient deficiencies, the symptoms of one problem may mask the symptoms of another. So the leaf tissue analysis may be the only way to determine what is wrong with your plants. So here we have the example of the data for hydrophonic tomato garden. So it is uh, from the month of July. So uh, from day one to day 20. So it has the AC, the pH, the uh, temperature, uh, the day temperature, the night temperature, and then the growth stage of the um, plant which is from seed to vegetative growth, and then the size, and then the comments. So meaning to say the observation per day uh, of this specific data for hydrophonic tomato garden. So always remember that um, in raising vegetables or plants in hydrophonic system, it is very important to know the um, nutrients needed by the plants. So whether it is a macronutrients and uh, micronutrients and always um, test the um, water or the solution itself or the nutrient solution if it is acidic or already alkaline um, for you to harvest uh, a good quality product of your plant. Thank you and have a nice day.